Uh, I'm going to switch gears a little bit and I'm going to focus mainly on broilers, but in actuality, some of the main kind of points we'll see also apply to the litter systems for turkey. So I'm going to be looking at broiler nutrient, litter nutrient content, and we're going to think about how it's affected by bedding management. And I might say, well, there we go. What's the situation? Why do we do this? Well, in South Carolina, as well as in many parts of the country, we use wood shavings or other type of traditional bedding, and it's getting expensive, hard to get. We have a lot of producers that are, where they're responding to that is either greatly reducing the amount of bedding or using none. And then the, at the same time, we started growing larger and larger birds, up to eight and nine pound average uh, weights at, at, at the, when we sell them. And then start keeping the litter longer in the house. For example, it used to be very common for broiler houses to be cleaned to the ground every six to 12 months. Uh, 12 months was the more uh, common practice. And now it can be one and a half, two years, and sometimes even more. So they're storing the litter in the house much longer. So this lack of bedding and longer storage of manure in the house, we have a couple of things that are kind of downsides. One is an increase in moisture in the litter and also ammonia in the house air. That's one. And then one of the consequences that we have to think about of high ammonia, yes, that's bad for birds, but it creates a need for extra minimum ventilation in the wintertime for both the ammonia and the moisture control. And the result is uh, producers are paying more in electricity and are also increasing their gas use. And so in many cases, in some severe winters, even in South Carolina, our winter heating costs have doubled because of uh, high moisture and high ammonia in the house. So this higher moisture also favors uh, odor production. And so one of the things we've seen in the last decade as things have changed is an increase in odor complaints, uh, even when uh, producers are not land applying litter. So my objective for this little presentation are two. First is using a couple of cases to demonstrate the impact of bedding management on the composition or really nutrient content of broiler litter. Um, we're going to look at an older farm that used lots of lots of bedding and a newer one that's using minimal to no bedding. And then we're going to take a couple of these ca this case study data and we're going to pull it in with some data from other barns looking at some potential correlations between anatomical nitrogen and moisture and the major plant nutrients and carbon nitrogen ratio. And we're looking at using these as two parameters that we can kind of use as indices to evaluate bedding management when looking at litter. So the first thing we need to talk about is, I use the term traditional bedding management. Uh, litter houses, whether it be in this case broilers, but it's true for turkeys. What they used to do or what's done if we're using a traditional method is before we place the flock, they put down six to eight inches of wood shavings uh, before the first flock. And then in between flocks, they would move this cake manure that uh, Kevin was talking about. And then add another one, two inches of fresh bedding Sometimes they'd even till it. And then with that complete clean out every, at least every year, and then they would start over with fresh bedding again. And that's what people are getting away from because of availability of litter um, shavings and as well as expense. Another thing we need to, I mentioned anatomical nitrogen. When we look at most of our litter analyses for plant nutrients, we, we usually see a line there that tells us how much ammonium nitrogen is in that litter. Well, actually, when the chemist does the work, does that test, they're actually measuring everything. Uh, most of it's ammonium and a little bit of it is ammonia. And so if I put them together, that's why I use this term TAN, or total anatomical nitrogen, or monocle nitrogen, depending on who you talk to. And the part that's ammonia is the part that can be released in the house air and cause problems for birds or increase odor uh, ammonia emissions from the house. And this fraction is pH dependent, it's an equilibrium function. And also a portion of organic in that's in the house and this litter, as it sits there, can also be converted to ammonium in. So here's to give you an idea of the equilibrium relationship we have here. Um, key thing to remember is if we could have a litter pH of six and a half or below, we're not gonna have any ammonia. And by and large, if we're in the, in the sevens, we're getting some measure of ammonia control. Well, another thing, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but um, 
there's treatments to basically influence litter pH. Currently, alum, there's some other acidifying products that are added to litter to reduce that pH for ammonia. And they provide ammonia control, and it's usually placed there before a flock is placed. And alum is of particular use because that's, there's a lot of people in our state using that. And basically, it's reacting with a soluble phosphorus, and there's an acidification process that's a consequence of that. And so the amount of alum is also, the amount we need is really dependent on the amount of manure in the house. We really could say the amount of soluble phosphorus from manure in the house or in the litter. So let's look at the traditional case. It was a barn uh, in Central South Carolina, it's old 40 by 500. There were lightweight birds, about four and a half, five, four and a half pounds at market. Uh, generous amounts of pine shavings. They removed cake between flocks and all the litter was removed uh, once a year. And we're looking at typical litter production of about six and a half wet tons per thousand square feet of floor area uh, per year. So here's some nutrient numbers that we're going to use kind of to compare, or we're going to use them to compare for this, this newer case. First thing I want you to note there at the top is we're looking at fairly dry litter, around 24% moisture, and 8.65 uh, is the pH. We, that's no alum was used, so it's a higher pH. And you can see the various nutrients. We're going to use those to, uh, for comparison, but because we're going to have a wide variation in moisture, we're going to actually use that percent dry basis number for a comparison. We've got to get the moisture effects out. And the other thing you see at the bottom there is C to N of 10.5. So this case will kind of be our basis for comparison. So here's the newer one. It's a broiler farm located also in South Carolina. They're a little bit larger barns, 42 by 500. When we did this study, they were growing, averaging 8.5 to 9, you could call it 8.8 .8 pound market weight. I put a minimal amount of pine shavings, but um, when we visited, you really couldn't see any, lit, any shavings at all. They're also experiencing some issues related to uh, restrictions and moving litter. The um, way it works is if there's a poultry farm in, the, in an area, a certain radius uh, or a region, that is, is hot for a certain avian disease, our state veterinarian basically puts a litter movement restriction and that creates troubles for producer. And one of the things the state veterinarians are recommending, and they still do, and it's a common practice now, is to use in-house wind rowing as a pseudo composting way to treat the litter for pathogens if you're not gonna pull the litter out. In this particular case, they're using minimal alum. What I mean by that is they're using alum and just the brooding in before the flocks. And because of all the things really weren't going the way they wanted, uh, they are having high odor from their houses and they were getting uh, odor complaints that were not just related to land application. So on this farm, we selected two houses side by side. Um, we sampled the litter before clean out. They produced, they've been producing for over a year, these big birds, about six flocks. House one, it was uh, received manure caking. They took the manure cakes between flocks. They did not add bedding. They did not do anything else. They did windrow. The second house they windrowed, but they didn't remove the caked litter. A lot of producers are now removing the caked litter with windrowing, which is definitely recommended. But when we looked at both of the houses, uh, the, the litter looked like fe beef feedlot manure. It was very dark in color, dense, uh, wet, and, and had quite a bit of odor to it. So some of the data that we collected, we got some litter samples on a grid pattern. Uh, we took some ammonia samples while we were there using Drager tubes. We measured the litter depth. We got those, those samples analyzed for, for nutrients, carbon, and moisture. And then when the house was cleaned out, the, the, this litter was brokered, so we're able to get the weight from the truck scales. So let's first look at about the mouth of litter in, in these two houses. The biggest thing we can see is litter depth was higher and litter volume was higher and the litter weight, wet tons per house, was higher when we wind rode and didn't decake. For sure that's an, an, an impact of caking versus decaking. And if we put it on tons per thousand square feet, you see 8.21 when it was unwind rode and decaked, 9.43. Uh, tons per thousand square feet when they wind rode, but they also took cake litter out between flocks. Both of those are much larger at six and a half wet tons per thousand square feet for a traditionally bedded barn. 
as we'd expect with pH, uh, where we have some um, alum use, we had a reduction in average litter pH, but still high enough to have appreciable ammonia in the house. So now let's look at some of these nutrients and moisture. Um, as we can see, I mentioned earlier, we're getting wetter litter where you can see it. Instead of 24 and some change, we're 28 to 32 percent moisture. Um, we're keeping that in the house. We're, we're basically increasing total nitrogen, we're increasing organic nitrogen as we keep this litter longer in the house, but we're also practically doubling the total anatomical nitrogen. And we think that the big increase in tan is not just from from storing more manure in the house, which they are, but also the fact that when we have higher moisture, we facilitate mineralization or transformation of organic in to the tan form, which basically resupplies ammonia to go back into the house. So which, here's the results from those quick and dirty Drager tube measurements. When we had unwind road litter and decent sized birds, but pretty good ventilation rates. We weren't at full tunnel, but we had enough to where a 20 parts per million ammonia was higher than what we would want, even what we expect. And house two, where they wind road, they had even higher moisture, they had even higher ammonia at 35. We look at a target of 15 under parts per million under true minimum winter ventilation. So these were high numbers and, and none of the company guys who were there were very happy with those. So here's where we were. So we're looking at this idea, okay, moisture and tan seem to be correlating. And so we took the data from the, these two farms and some other barns, threw them together. And it's not fantastic. There's other things going on, but we're definitely seeing a positive correlation that's significant. In other words, as that litter moisture is going up, we are seeing more total anatomical nitrogen. We have more potential for ammonia emissions into the air and out of the house. Let's look at carbon. Carbon's in, in the other nutrients. First of all, carbon is something we don't normally measure. We did this because we were thinking we could use C to N ratio as an index to how we're doing on bedding management and that kind of thing. So if you look at the traditionally bedded house to the other, uh, to other two, we're, they're ha they have less carbon, and we're going to see that what we found is that's mainly carbon from manure. So carbon's carbon, yes, but some comes from bedding and some comes from manure. That's one reason we need to look at C to N. I showed 10 and a half there for the traditionally bedded, but we're looking at 7, 6, and 7, 8 for these other two houses. Basically, a C to N that's actually a little lower than as excreted manure. But we can also see as we store uh, litter in the house longer, all three, not just nitrogen, but also uh, phosphorus and potassium contents are increased on a dry matter basis uh, from this. So we saw a 10% reduction in carbon, but we saw C to N went down by 27. So that's why we're thinking about C to N is kind of that index that tells us something about uh, bedding management. And also, you know, the higher the C D N, there'd be higher bedding, there'd be more dilution. So we would expect the, the dry basis contents to go down. And when we pooled it with other data again, like we did with the uh, tan, we saw that, okay, for two of them, total nitrogen had the best correlation, negatively correlated. Uh, phosphorus is total phosphorus is P205, uh, is also negatively correlated, was significant, but the uh, potash one was not, is, was not very significant, which was kind of expected because that's more associated with uh, litter moisture. So we're kind of looking at C to N. Basically, if we have more C to N, that, that's helping us, that's telling us we've got better litter management, better bedding use. Um, so that's what looks like one of the indices we're using for evaluation. So, reduced bedding use and delayed clean out was related to low seed in and higher plant nutrients, and the big three, NPK. These results also demonstrate if we look at older extension literature that's tied to older management uh, method, uh, bedding management practices, then the numbers really don't apply in many cases for current nutrient management needs or even looking at composting or anything else. So basically we need to use data that corresponds to the practices that are on the farm that we're, that we're working with. This impact of moisture and tan, lack of bedding and storing manure in the house, yep, we get more litter, we, we more litter moisture and we get more ammonia, more ammonium, all those things that are tan. 
And so the resulting trend is higher ammonia emissions and more problems in the house. And so if a producer is experiencing problems, one of the best ways to begin solving the problems is increase bedding use and clean out more often. In other words, deal with both issues. Two parameters we're looking at uh, is C to N and, tan, uh, and moisture content. Uh, C to N of 10 is kind of our target and we'd like to have dry moisture. So you say a target about 